All right, kids, time for your favorite segment, story time with Chris. When I was in high school, you couldn't take photography till grade 10 or 10th grade for the Yankees watching. But from the time I was able to, I spent pretty much my entire high school career in the dark room because, you know, my whole life is a dark room. One big dark room. But just like our high school queen, Lydia Dietz, I couldn't stay in the dark room forever. And once high school finished, I pretty much gave up on film photography. Sure, I occasionally found my way back to film over the years, but these short trips ended the same way that all love affairs do. Me, broke, and covered in chemical burns. But here we are almost 20 years later, and I guess I haven't really learned my lesson because I'm back at it, only this time with the excuse that I can say my clients actually want film from me as some thinly veiled excuse to perform my art, whatever that means. Unfortunately, just like this grainy day's impression, just because something's different doesn't mean it's good. So let's cut the bullshit and talk about why I'm back into film and whether or not it's actually doing anything for my business. What's up? My name's Chris Tejas. I'm a photographer and videographer based in Ontario, Canada. I mainly shoot weddings, events, portraits. Uh, if there's a person involved, I'm gonna shoot it. That's what I say here on YouTube, at least. I also do a lot of other random stuff though, so I don't know if that actually holds as true as I say it does. Today we're talking about film photography and how I am starting to incorporate it into what I do professionally as well as for fun. This kind of came about because I started to have a few different people reach out and ask me about the viability of shooting film for uh, for their event or wedding or what have you. I figured, you know, I, I have a background in shooting film. It's something I did for a long time and I really loved, uh, but that was so long ago. And it's been a really interesting endeavor to see how I can make that work financially as well as just, um, if I could produce good work on film? And that's the big question. Because there's no point in me charging more for something that looks worse. And I don't think film necessarily looks better. Uh, some people like to act like film is necessarily a better medium than digital. It, it comes down to the shots, of course. Uh, and for me, I think the biggest thing is that it is just a learning curve as to how to properly work with different film stocks, how to work with the cameras you're using and all that kind of stuff. So I'll run you through the cameras I'm using and a little bit about uh, how I am charging for this moving forward. So I basically decided on two systems that I was gonna use for my film cameras, Minolta and Canon. This might change in the future, but for now it's what's feeling really good. Uh, the Minolta is the Minolta X700. I have it right here, just wait one second. I'll do that little close up thing. Isn't that cute? Uh, this is a great little camera. The first camera I ever got was the Minolta X370 and I found it the other day at my mom's place when I went to visit, which was pretty cool. I'm not totally sure it's in good enough shape to use, but it was pretty fun to find and I also had a nice little 50mm 1.7 lens there, which I actually already own, but why not have a second copy? I chose the X700 because I wanted a camera with a light meter for sure. I just knew that the way that I was going to have to use it on like wedding days and events, I didn't want to have to be pulling out a, a, a separate light meter and one that I could trust. And from what I had heard, the X700 is a pretty solid light meter. I would say the only kind of frustration with it is the fact that it is a prism style focusing system and it's a little tricky sometimes, especially in low light to get proper uh, focus as well as the fact that it does this weird thing where the light meter will show you where your uh, exposure should be, like where your shutter speeds should be, but it won't show you where it actually is. So if you're on 1 250th of a second and you need to be at 1 500th, it'll show you you need to be at 1 500th, but it doesn't have a secondary light to show you that you're at 250. This is something they improved on in the later models, uh, as well as some of the lower cost models, which is interesting, but just wasn't present. Uh, for this, I have a few different lenses that I really like. I have a 28mm f2.8. It's 28mm f2.8. I also have a 50mm f2, a 50mm f1.7, and a 135 f3.5. The 135 is a little bit soft, um, so I don't really use it that much, but it is kind of fun to use in certain scenarios. But the 51.7 and the 52 are both great, and the 28mm 2.8 is probably my favorite of all of them. And it's actually made me really love the 28 mil, so much so that I picked up the Canon EF 28 1.8 recently to use with my R5. The great thing about that 28 millimeter lens is it is an EF mount, so it does work with my Canon film camera, which is the EOS 1N. Why did I go with the EOS 1N? I wanted a camera that had good autofocus, that was reliable, and that I could use with EF glass so that I could swap between that and my R5 really seamlessly. I have a bunch of RF mount glass for my Canon R5, but I also have EF mounts and the EF to RF adapter, and that helps me to kind of use everything the way I want to. It's, it's a pretty cool system and, and it's working really well so far. Another thing I picked up was two different adapters. I have an MD to EF, which allows me to use all of that beautiful Minolta glass on my Canon EOS 1N. 
and I also have an MD to RF, which means I can use it on my R5. So now I can use that Minolta glass across all three of my cameras, and on a wedding day or an event or something, I can, I can just have a lot of different options. Sometimes having too many options is not a good thing, but in this scenario, I think it's kind of cool to be able to use the same glass across three different systems and, and get good results as long as you're comfortable with manual focus. So that's the basic setup. Those are the cameras I have, and I have a few lenses for each of them, and I'm starting to incorporate it. So what's the feedback so far? Well, it's it's a little hard to say because it's early days. I've only really done two shoots for clients where I've used this system. The first one was for Final Final Co, and they're a local production company here, and they make beautiful work. I'll link some of it down below. And I was doing BTS for them, and I was using my Lumix S52X, and I was capturing a lot of video as well as digital photos for them. And then I also brought the Minolta X700 along with a roll of the uh, Kodak Eastman 250XX black and white film. Uh, I got that through Panda Plush. He is our local film developer here and he's an absolute wizard. And uh, if you don't have a Panda Plush, that's too bad because Panda Plush rules. I got back the scans from that and I was pretty happy with it. It was the first roll I ran through the Minolta X700 and I think overall it turned out pretty good. I would say there's definitely some keepers in there and it was a nice thing to add on top of everything. However, I did not charge them extra for that because it was just kind of an experiment. Regardless, they were super happy with it. They shared it, they used the photos and, and everything went well. The second shoot I did was for Street Brew, which is a coffee roaster here in Canada, and they were celebrating their fifth anniversary. My friend Caitlin asked if I could come out and uh, take some photos for them and help them just to celebrate their fifth anniversary. So I used this combo, the Canon R5, the EOS 1N, and the Minolta X700. I shot on everything. I had black and white going through the X700, and then I had uh, a roll of the Pro 100 from uh, Reflex Lab going through that sweet EOS 1N. Overall, I was really happy with some of the results that I got from that. I got a portrait of Caitlin that I absolutely love and it's probably one of my favorite portraits I've taken in quite a while. I think it turned out beautifully and, and it was great. It was a great addition. So then how do you charge for this? What's the workflow? What's the turnaround time? These are all questions that you kind of have to ask and here's what's making sense to me right now. Basically, I've come up with a price per roll that helps to make this all make sense. And that's gonna be about $45 per roll. That's gonna allow me to buy the film, get it scanned and developed, and that's gonna be the roll price per roll that I shoot for them. We will come up with a number of rolls that they want me to shoot beforehand so that we know we're gonna stick within that budget. Along with the processing and developing, there's also just gonna be a flat fee added on top of any shoot that wants film photography. This is really just because we're adding something additional to the day that requires more thought process, more headspace, more equipment, all of that kind of stuff, things you would normally charge for. In the same way that if you were asked to shoot photo and then later they wanted to add video, you would increase your rate. Same thing with film photography. The other caveat here is everyone involved has to understand that film photography comes with more potential problems. So can we guarantee that every single shot that we put through is going to be a keeper? No, but it's the same thing with digital. Ultimately, if I take 3000 photos on a wedding day, not all 3000 are gonna be ones that'll end up in the gallery. You know, maybe 30% of those end up in the gallery. Same thing with the film photography. I would say 30% of them, 40%, 50%, hopefully a higher percentage are gonna end up there because we're gonna be taking our time with this. We're gonna be more thoughtful about the way that we shoot. However, everyone involved has to understand there's uh, some risk involved. And if they're willing to be comfortable with that and I'm willing to do my absolute best to make sure that as many keepers come through as possible, I think you know we reach a really nice balance. How much am I charging on top? It's relative to what we're doing. You know, weddings are different than events, are different than commercial shoots, are different than BTS. But overall, uh, it's going to be a percentage relative to the amount that they're paying uh, for my services to begin with. So I'm really happy with my setup. It, it needs more work. I need to get more stuff for it. But right now, I feel like I understand how I could effectively add this into a wedding day, and it would be. A ton of fun and I would get something really unique and I'm super excited because I do have a wedding coming up in a couple weeks where they want to include film so this will be the first one where we're adding film into the package and I think it's gonna be very very cool so let me know what you do do you shoot film on a wedding day do you have any advice do you have any anything that you would add in the comments that might help somebody in a scenario like me where they're just kind of starting out and they're thinking about this what do you do to make it effective and financially viable for your business uh, let me know below thanks so much